So we have Dr. Prabhakar Rao, the chairman of Sri Sri Institute of Agricultural Sciences and Technology. Uh, he will be talking on cogent statement of knowledge and ideas uh, in the field of agricultural sciences and applications and way forward. India is based with traditional ecological knowledge that dates back over 5000 years in the field of agriculture. Dr. Rao has been exploring ancient texts like Kirishi, Parashara and Vriksha Yurveda for uh, the solutions to pressing problems in agriculture today. Uh, this talk explores the holistic philosophy of our ancients in terms of agriculture and how coexistence and not conflict was the basis of their understanding in relation to pests and weeds. Dr. Rao explores this TEK method in seeking sustainable solutions for integrated pest man management, use of desi cow urine in extracting alkaloids and have pest repellent properties and the way pests are classified by the ancients make a compelling case for their revival today. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here at this August campus and always uh, wonderful to connect with, uh, with uh, Dr. Richa Chopra and the team that's been putting this uh, symposium together. So, all of us eat and food is sustaining our lives. And of course, we all had breakfast this morning. I had some wonderful poha that was given in the guest house, uh, very tasty. But how many of us really know what we are eating? Okay. I belong to the generation of scientists which brought the Green Revolution to the country. My mentors were people like Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, Dr. M. B. Rao. And today I am a farmer. I farm myself and I am a seed keeper. What is it that we are actually eating? You know, especially when it comes to vegetables and grains and milk. Uh, we are fed at home. The lady of the house goes and buys these things from the market and says, if I feed it to my children, then, you know, they will become very strong. The reason why I am taking this uh, presentation this way is to understand the cogent statement of our traditional knowledge we need to realize where we are at the moment and why it is important for us. Otherwise, it's always lovely to talk about our ancient knowledge, but there is a disconnect between that knowledge and what is urgency, what is the urgency of the present day. Yeah? So there were some questions like, if we don't have nutritional security, what happens? Yeah? So it's very important to understand where we are now and is there, first of all, a dire need for us to look into that ancient knowledge. Ancient knowledge is always very romantic. You know, it, it gives you a sense of, uh, you know, identity and it gives you a sense of culture and heritage. But how relevant is it today? Why are we talking about it today? Is there a need for us to be talking today? This is the first uh, part of my lecture or presentation rather, where I will set up a base why the cogent statement becomes important. So, there was a little research that I did nearly 10 years ago when I went to the Mandis around Bangalore, where I stay, where the Ashram of Art of Living is and uh, our institute is. And we collected samples of various vegetables, milk, fruit, cereals, whatever. And we sent it to Mysore, to CFTRI, Central Food Technology Research Institute. And we said, let us analyze this for toxic residues. And what came out was very, very disturbing. If I take, for example, rice, the figure in red, 0.36, is the minimum level of toxic pesticide residue above which it makes that rice uneatable, not fit for eating. That means it becomes a poison. 0.36 parts per million 
of that pesticide residue will make that rice unfit for consumption. What did I find there? It was 1,324 parts per million. Nearly 4,000 times the minimum limit prescribed by the government of India, which says this food is edible. And the same story, you will go through all the vegetables and fruits that we have. At least a thousand times over the prescribed safety limit by the government is what we are finding in food. And we are eating this. The fault is not yours. The fault is not the farmers. The fault lies somewhere else. And partly, in a way, I am to blame for it also. So, when we look at data like this, is this data available? Yes, it is available. If you Google and if you go to Google Scholar Docs, if you do research of scientific articles, you will find this data. This data is all over the place. Everybody knows this data. And everybody knows how dangerous this data is. I will give you another piece of data. Residues of toxic pesticides like captan. Captan is a very dangerous one. Yeah, that's the one that I've shown you at the lowest. And we have taken what is happening in vegetables, yeah, especially vegetables like cauliflower. You see what there is a blue line and a red line. Yeah, it's very interesting. Captan is a fungicide, and for growing vegetables, farmers use it like there is no tomorrow. They put so much of captan powder because they want to save the seedling. They are paying hybrid capsicum seedlings, for example, will cost per acre over two and a half lakh rupees. Now, one seedling, if they lose, they are losing a lot of money. So they will want to save it. And root wilt and, uh, is one of the very common uh, reasons why the seedlings die. So they put captan like there is no tomorrow. Now, very interesting thing about captan is, you will see all my uh, all the pesticides that I've listed have a blue band and there is a red band. Now, the blue band is the prescribed limit in India, which is 15,000 ppb. That's parts per billion. Yeah? So, that will actually become 0.15, uh, uh, 0 0.015. Yeah? So, um, if we look at it, 15,000 parts per billion, is the recommended limit of captan in India. In the European Union, the recommended limit is only 20 ppb. How is it that a human being in Europe is told not to eat anything that has more than 20 ppb, while in India, we legally mandate that up to 15,000 ppb is okay to be eaten. So, seven and a half thousand times or seven and yeah seven seven and a half thousand times the limit which is permissible in eu is permissible in india and then we have another thousand times over that in the market just try to understand what we are eating this is not really to scare you but just to understand why the cogent statement becomes more important we brush this aside every day there are several reasons for that, I will not go into it. But just for you to understand, what are we eating? Are we eating food or are we consuming poison? Now, go to Google Scholar Docs, just put a search, pesticide residue and human health. And you will find a whole lot of connections, proper scientific data to show you direct correlation, covariances that have been statistically established between all the major disorders, polycystic ovary for example, non-fatty uh, non uh, liver, yeah, non-alcoholic fatty liver, sorry, non-alcoholic fatty liver, yeah, Parkinson's, autism, Alzheimer's, kidney, 
cause cancer everybody knows we know about the Batinda Express right but this is a fact the fact that pesticide residues in our food are directly linked to our health is a known fact there is no disputing it it's like cancer and cigarette smoking are directly linked everybody knows that and yet we seem to tiptoe around this information if you took for example the use of a chemical called glyphosate which goes under the market name roundup this is a chemical which is used to suppress weeds it kills weeds and monsanto has developed crops where you can spray this pesticide the crop will not die but the rest of the weeds will die we have a tremendous labor shortage in agriculture today and the farmer is left with no option but to use roundup in extensive quantities it is a very 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 glyphosate is a very toxic chemical and today we can see strong correlations between the incidence of autism it's not just autism almost all neural disorders today have got direct link with increasing use of glyphosate in our weed control which brings me to this man was he a savior or was he a monster everybody all of you know about the harbor process right where we take nitrogen from the air we take uh, hydrogen and under intense pressure and heat we create ammonia now ammonia is one of the starting points for the production of urea and all the companies that i can name for you today which are very very uh, well known companies uh, you take BASF, Byers, Dow Corning, yeah. Syngenta, China Chem, Monsanto. All of these are the major fertilizer producers today of this world. And they will tell you that Haber was the man who invented a way by which we could make bread from air. Nitrogen is abundant in the air. But to make bread from air, he was the one who pioneered it and they revere him as the man who was responsible for creating a technology where nitrogen could be fixed from the air to give us urea. But if you look at the patent, it's not held by Fitzhaber, it's held by uh, BASF, Bardation and Lili Zuda Fabric, BASF. And BASF never invented this process for making urea. They invented this process to make ammonium nitrate, which is the starting point for explosives. They were the ones who supplied the arms and ammunition for the First World War and the Second World War. Regardless of who fought whom, BASF, Byers, Monsanto, Dow Corning, Syngenta, all these companies made immense profits harbor never discovered fixing ammonia fixing nitrogen for agriculture you can go down and, and google this i'm not i'm not uh, making this up go and google he did this because in the first world war the allies cut off the access to the kuana manure which is uh, bird droppings off the coast of south america which was the starting point for making explosives those days. So Haber invented this process. He didn't stop here. He went on to may, uh, uh, use these in these famous rail guns. He went on to make gases, chemical warfare, and all these gases like tear gas, chlorine, phosphogene, diphosphogene, mustard gas, tabun, sarine, Soman, cyclosari, all these gases were created commercially. He invented processes to create this commercially to kill soldiers in the battlefield. In fact, just one, uh, you can see these are, this is the chemical bombs that he prepared. And uh, in just one day on the Western Front, he managed to lop off 76,000 French troops using chlorine and on the Eastern Front the very next day 
120,000 Russian soldiers died because they used chemical warfare. Harbour was the man behind this. Now, karma is a small cycle. His wife, who was also a chemist, worked with him. She couldn't understand how this man became such a monster. In their drawing room, in their living room, she shot herself. She couldn't withstand it. That was how deeply she felt about it. And this, have, this was in World War I. World War II, the same gases which Harbour invented commercial production for were used to exterminate his next generation of Jews by Hitler. So let's understand that these chemicals, whether it's urea, whether it is uh, NPK or whether it's any of these chemicals that I talked about, the chemical gases, they were never meant for agriculture. All the chemical pesticides that we use today in agriculture will be tracing their origin. Their starting point will be one of these eight gases. NPK is the, like we get ammonium phosphate and ammonium sulfate. These are nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. So you get fertilizers which is a combination of nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. So all the pesticides that we have today, even today, they will derive their genealogy from these chemical warfare gases. So from explosives, so what happened? The Second World War ended. All these companies like Bayer's, uh, BASF, Syngenta, Monsanto, Dow Corning, all these uh, pioneer, all these companies were left with huge production capacities for ammonia, for these chemical gases, warfare gases, and they didn't have a market. That is when these companies said, we will teach you how to grow food. Till then the world was growing food. But they said, we will teach you how to make bread from air. Today, uh, you can see, I mean, almost there's been a lot of uh, mergers of these companies. And today, it is just uh, in 2017, there were four corporations controlling the seed, the fertilizer, the pesticides. Those who fell sick eating this food, the pharmaceutical is also controlled by them. The hospital industry is also controlled by them. The insurance for the hospital industry is controlled by them. The banks which give the insurance is also controlled by them. And the media, of course. So it gives you an idea. Now there are only three because Syngenta and BASF again also merged together. So we've just got three corporations who do this. Anyway, we will not look at that. I will go back to my days of my doctoral studies and as a plant breeder uh, in India at the time of the Green Revolution. We were actually given a diktat by the government to provide food security. And I think we did our job. Today, India has food security. But what I want you to think about is, suppose that mandate was, suppose the government had said, you scientists work and give the nation nutritional security. Our approach would have been very, very different. If we had looked at nutrition per acre instead of yield per acre, we probably would not be in this mess where we are consuming poison instead of eating food. So let me try to tell you a very interesting uh, understanding which, not, it is, which is not discussed. Uh, in, I, have, I have made my presentations in other campuses of IIT like in uh, Guwahati. Uh, at international platforms, but nobody discusses this, yeah, because this is a very interesting, uh, there's a very interesting, I would say, a secret that is buried in what we call the soil health card. Any agriculture, modern industrial agriculture is dependent on this analysis. It's like your blood test, yeah. Without this, there is no, uh, chemical agriculture possible because first thing you do is get your soil tested. So what is a soil test basically? 
it's a test where soil is given. So you take random samples from your land and you give it to the Krishi Kendra, Krishi Vikas Kendra, uh, KVKs, and then they will, or a laboratory, laboratory, and then they will test it for various nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, copper, zinc, whatever, whatever. So it's like a blood test report. There is a column which says all these nutrients. Then there is a column which says how much your land has. Then there is a column which says how much it should have. And if you look below, it will tell you what you should go to the market and buy to supplement what is missing. This is the basis of chemical industrial agriculture, modern agriculture, which we are following today. Very interestingly, there is in front of every nutrient, instead of saying nitrogen, it will say available nitrogen. You can see that. You can available nitrogen, available phosphorus, available potassium, available copper, available zinc. Why this word available in front of the nutrient? Why couldn't they just say nitrogen and be done with it? Why do they put this word available? I asked the Krishi Kendras, nobody had an answer. I asked the professors, soil science department professors, why is this word available? They said that that's what it is, that's what the test tells us, available. I said, but why do you say available? No answer. So I said, listen, let me do a calculation. Let me try and see. So this word available, eventually, what it meant was the protocol for testing the soil takes the soil and it they put they put a measured quantity of soil, then they have a burette which takes a measured quantity of water or a very dilute acid and then they take the uh, extract that comes out of that and they test it. So anything that's soluble easily is what appears in the report. That's why they use the word available. And when I calculated how much, if I gave 1 kilo of soil or 10 kilo of soil to the laboratory, in the report, how much of my soil is showing up in this report, it's that little red sliver, 0.00087% is all that you see in the report. The rest of the 99.9913%, all the blue portion does not appear in your report. It's just that sliver, that small red sliver that comes up in your report. So I said, I want to know what the rest of my 99.99913% is. They said, we don't know how to test that. Then I said, who knows? Then they said, the mines and geology department might know how to do that. I said, okay, go to the mines and geology department. And I want the analysis of my entire soil, 100% of my soil, not that little sliver that comes up in the soil test report. And they said, Okay, it's going to take a time, it's going to take a lot of money. I said, no problem, I have the time, I'll make available the money. But I want to know what the entire soil that I've given to the lab is made of. And imagine, there is tons of nitrogen, there is tons of phosphorus, there is tons of potassium, there is tons of every conceivable element that is required for plant growth, albeit in a chelated form, that is in a bound mineral form which does not appear in my soil test report because it's not available. Now what, why wouldn't somebody tell me that I have everything and our cogent knowledge of ancient agriculture technologies gives me a way of tapping that. If somebody told me that, then I would not go to the market and buy bags and bags of urea and NPK and come and put it into my soil, right? But nobody tells you that. They tell you you are deficient in nitrogen, you are deficient in phosphorus, you are deficient in potash, you are deficient in copper, blah, blah, blah. Buy all this, put it and you have agriculture and you will get the yields that you want. They are right. But that's not the only way. Because what happens when I put these fertilizers is, I am growing a baby on formula food. The baby looks very healthy. It looks very rounded and very nice and chubby. But one little breeze and it gets a cold. It has no inherent immunity. Same thing with my plant. When I put urea, it just boosts. 
but it has no inherent in here, uh, immunity and it's a flag saying, come on insects, come on insects, eat me, I am lush, ready for you. And when the insects come, I douse them with the pesticides also available in this technology. I eat that and then you know what you are eating. The first two slides showed you what we are eating. So this is a vicious cycle. And then the hybrid seed, me as a plant breeder, the first criteria as a plant breeder is what we call the efficacy of nitrogen absorption. This is the primary target of a plant breeder. How quickly does my plant take nitrogen from the soil is the first breeding objective. So that the more urea I can give it, the faster it will grow. But the weaker it will be, more pesticides I will use, more poisonous food I will produce. That's the cycle. So when I looked at all these uh, uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, data that emerged, there is a mantra for chemical industrial agriculture. The soil is just a medium. It has no, it has no uh, inherent nutritional capability. It's just a medium. It's like silica sand that you use in a filter for swimming pools. It's just a medium. And everything else has to be given to it by bought off the market. So, no fertilizers equals no growth is the mantra for chemical farming. So, net-net, because these nutrients are not available, they are in a chelated mineral form, therefore they are not they are not at all relevant to agriculture. Organic farming, by the way, the experiment that Sri Lanka did, is also not a sustainable technology because organic farming also states that new, the soil itself has nothing in it. I have to give a lot of compost or farmyard manure and that farmyard manure will sustain my agriculture. That is what is said. So again, the assumption is that the soil has got nothing. And the composting process is a process where intense heat is produced. Even people who do composting at home knows that there's a lot, heat, lot of heat that gets produced. And if you put your finger there, you actually uh, blister your finger with the heat. So everything dies, everything gets killed off. Seeds of weeds, all the bacteria, fungi, all, all the worms, earthworms, everything gets killed off when you're doing composting. So you take organic matter and you ferment it to create. Now a lot of people think that in India, before chemical farming, we did organic farming, which is the greatest myth. Organic farming was introduced to India only in 1940 by this gentleman Albert Howard, who in the city of Indore in Madhya Pradesh, created what was called for the first time in India, the indoor method of composting. Not indoor, indoor method of composting named after the city. Now, we feel that this organic farming is our tradition. It is our parampara. It is belonging to ancient culture. It is not. We never had organic comp uh, compost uh, agriculture in our ancient times. We never believed in this because the economics doesn't work out. If you want to do genuine organic farming, you require annual production of 20 cows manure to fertilize one acre of land. That costs around 45,000 rupees. No way a farmer can use this. Now the, the numbers don't match because if I have, let us say, 1,000 acres in my village, I require 20, uh, I require 20,000 cows. Where will the cows graze? Where will the food for the cows come from? It is a model that was doomed to fail even when Albert Howard in 1940 introduced it. The British knew about this. But it was just a way to sort of comfort farmers who didn't want to get into chemical agriculture because they claimed that something called sattva in their soil was being destroyed by the chemicals, the white powder that was being given to them. And they started to agitate. To quell that agitation, they said, we will give you a technique where 
you can do without chemicals and they gave them a technique that was doomed to fail. It never succeeded in 1940, it never succeeded, it is not succeeded today, it is not going to succeed in the future. The numbers just don't match up and that is why Sri Lanka failed. Now, marginal farmers, most of 60 percent of our agriculture is marginal farmers, therefore this technology can never work, um, India can never become organic. Now, if there is, is there a technology therefore, and also we can understand that there is a lot more apart from the fact that I said immense amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and potash and all the nutrient elements required for agriculture are in a chelated form, that is they are in a bound form in soil. There is incredible amount, over 10 million tons of nitrogen that gets fixed because of lightning. The moment nitrogen gets fixed to nitrous oxide or nitric oxide, it combines with the water to form nitrous acid or nitric acid. But the moment it hits the ground, mother nature just chelates them. It chelates them to form complex minerals so that they don't get washed off to the sea. It's preserving the nitrogen that is coming naturally by chelating it and keeping it there. That never, never gets expressed in the soil test report. Yeah? But nature's way of doing it, it's like, a, it's like the lady of the house in a farm, when the harvest comes, she collects all the harvest which comes at a time and carefully stores it to give it to the family every day, little by little. Nature does the very same thing. All the elements that come down because of the lightning, because of erosion, because of uh, various other weathering processes which get exposed in a nano farm, nano form are immediately chelated by nature. Reason is she does not want them to flow to the sea. Urea when we apply and there is a rain, it flows into our aquifers, it flows into our lakes, it flows into the ocean and that is why we have the nitrogen pollution that happens, the algal blooms that happen, right. Now, if you look at a rock like this a, a, on any mountainside or any of the uh, hillsides, you will find some a, a life form that is called lichen. Lichen is a sort of a primitive plant you could say, I have never used the word primitive, it is a plant uh, which is a combination of bacteria and fungi and it is used as food by many animals including reindeer. In the tundra for example, this is the only thing that grows and reindeer actually eats it. Reindeers eat it, yeah. So, how does this grow on this rock? Rock, if I gave it to my soil test report lab, he will say it has nothing in it because there is nothing available. But how does this plant grow? It grows because nature has a way to break a mineral into soluble nutrients. There are bacteria, there are fungi, there are many, many microbes and insects like and worms like earthworms who have the technology for millions of years on this planet to solubilize the mineral nutrients in the soil. This is what happens in virgin forests. Who is going into our western ghats or the Himalayan virgin forests and pouring urea and NPK and spraying chloroferifos and all that. No, everything is growing. Why is it growing? Because the soil has what our ancestors called sattva. What was that sattva? Because it is full of so nutrient solubilizing microbes. Now what is this nutrient solubilizing microbes? Nature can break down minerals. So all these minerals, if you look under an uh, electron microscope, you can actually see how the fungi and the bacteria work together and release the nutrients from these complex minerals. Now, mother nature has the technology to look at the entire 100% of the soil, not that little sliver of 0.00087% that appears in the soil test report. Now we come to the actual cogent statement. So my first part of the talk was basically for you to understand the fallacy on which chemical agriculture 
is mounted. It's mounted on the soil test report. All the problems of moder modern agriculture come from the soil test report because we don't address 99.99913% of the soil. That's why we are in the mess we are in. Now, our traditional ecological knowledge that comes from the wonderful civilizations which uh, uh, Ganti uh, Murti, Dr. Ganti Murti spoke about this morning are wonderful practices. He touched upon most of the things that uh, are relevant here, so I will not go too deep into that. But the only, there is one system of agriculture, which is the uh, agriculture which is described from the Vedic times, which for the want of a better word, we can call natural farming or Vedic agriculture, which looks at this 99.99913% of the soil instead of looking at 0.00087%. How does this technology release micro, using microbes release the nutrients? So let's just uh, go back. In the chemical agriculture, the mantra was no fertilizer, no yield. Organic farming, no compost, no yield. The mantra for natural farming is no microbes, no yield. Now, especially in Australia, in the past 10 years, especially in the last 5 years, tremendous work has been done on these NSMs, nutrient solubilizing microbes. And one of the beautiful symbiotic relationships that scientists have discovered is that the plant and the microbes act as one community. When we talk about biodiversity above the soil in terms of flora and fauna, we forget the biodiversity under the soil. There is a huge complex ecosystem. Yeah, uh, Secret Life of Trees, for example, uh, the book uh, you, you could look at and it tells you how plants communicate with each other. Plants send signals to each other. Plants send signals to microbes. So when a plant, for example, wants nitrogen, it sends a signal to the microbe. The nearest microbe around the root hair, an enlarged root hair is what I have shown on the uh, right hand side of the drawing. So you see that little elongated thing, that's a root hair. So the microbe closes there, it quickly comes and it breaks a complex mineral and gives one ion of nitrogen to the plant. And what does the plant do in return? It gives it one molecule of sugar. It's a very beautiful system. The plant cannot take directly the mineral for its nutrient. The microbe cannot directly break that mineral to get sugar for its growth. But the plant can signal the microbe, microbe will break the mineral and the mineral is given to the plant, plant returns the favor by giving a molecule of sugar. This is documented science. Our ancients knew about this thousands and thousands of years ago. It's, we are pushing the, the number back to 25,000 years now. But now dating, for example, is showing us uh, 40,000 years ago. Yeah. So when we talk about formulation of Kunap Jala, for example, which Ganti Murti in the morning uh, talked about, uh, use of excreta and blood, ma bone marrow and blood and everything, uh, sounds a bit gory, but look at the look at the evolved understanding of the people there. There is an animal, and they have to eat the animal, but every part of the animal will get recycled, and it gets recycled to create crops which they will eat, which the animal will eat, they will eat, and then the whole cycle is very very a perfect feedback loop that exists. Yeah, so. Nutrient mineralization is the rule in nature. But when I put one teaspoon of urea into the soil, the microbes 
disappear completely. Which is why once you've used chemical in your farm, you have no option but to use it again and again and again because the microbes have been taken out of the equation. So that is why the industry survives. It survives because it gives you seeds which you cannot multiply. The hybrid seeds and the GMO seeds, you cannot make seed from seed. You have to buy the seed every season. The fertilizer, once you put it in the soil, the sattva is removed, it's gone, and you have to put fertilizer every time. It's an addiction that you create to the soil. So, once you get into this, there is no way you get out of this, which is the spiral, the spiral of the debt trap, because you have to invest a lot to buy these fertilizers, buy these pesticides, buy the seed, do the agriculture. If there is a calamity and you don't get the crop, all that money, you cannot repay the banks and therefore you might take your life. Because it is investment heavy. While there is more food being generated, the quality of which is highly questionable as I showed you at the beginning of this talk, the risk for the farmer is also very high because it's high investment, right? Therefore, to get out of this, if we go the route that our ancients took, there is a very good chance we will get out of it. So the remaining part of my talk, and I think I'm keeping good time now, is about where do you find these nutrient solubilizing microbes in nature. You see this seal of the Mohenjo-daro, they have a huge respect they pay to the cow that's called the Brahman cow. Yeah, that's a species that is known as Bos indicus. Bos taurus is the western cow. It has a separate lineage. Bos indicus has got a separate lineage. A very interesting thing I will share because I am in an academic institution. The archaeology of the evolution of Bos taurus and Bos indicus is very interesting. You could google this at some point. Bos taurus, if you go through layers of civilization from recent to old, Bos taurus in the oldest layers will appear as a wild animal. That means not domesticated. Its bones will appear in isolation to human bones. As you come closer to more recent times, you will start seeing some animal bone with human bones. That means that animal was from wild being slowly domesticated. As you come to the uh, more recent, you will find Bos taurus largely existing only as a domesticated animal. Bos taurus today is a completely domesticated animal. Yeah? You have some, some cows which uh, free graze, but they are still domesticated. Yeah? So they will you will find their bones and human bones intricately, uh, intimately linked. You will never find them in the wild again. Yeah? Whereas Bos indicus, so far, all the excavations that have happened will show from the oldest bone of Bos indicus that has ever been found, it has been found with human bones. Till now, we do not have a shred of evidence to show that Bos indicus was ever a wild animal. It's very interesting for you to ponder on this, I mean, uh, and why it is like that. So, Bos indicus is a very interesting animal because its entire elementary canal is very different from Bos taurus. It's one and a half times longer and it has huge number of cul-de-sacs. Uh, it has like pouches. All along the elementary canal there are pouches with apparently no function. But they are full of microbes. Here is a bioessay that I am presenting which takes in the TUs. TUs are taxonomic units of NSMs, nutrient-solubilizing uh, nutrient microbes. And if you take this, you will see how rich the TU pie chart for 
the boss indicus cow dung is. Very rich. There is at least one family of microbes for every nutrient required by the plant. Which means if these nutrients are established in the soil, your plant needs no additional fertilizer. Just like in the forest and whatever, it will grow. I work with 2.2 million farmers across the country, 22 lakh farmers across the country. They practice this and they are practicing it sustainably. And what they produce is nutrition, not poison. So when we look at uh, the formulations like Jeevamrita, Gana Jeevamrita, Panchagavya, Kunupajala, all these formulations, the principle is very much the same. You take the fresh cow dung of Boss Indicus cow and you exponentially multiply the microbes. See, in composting, you kill the microbes. In this technology, you exponentially multiply it by giving it protein and sugar. How do you give protein? In Kurum Jala, they used, uh, you know, animal waste and uh, bone marrow and uh, animal flesh and all those things. In modern day, we use pulse powder like, you know, Chanaka Atta or green gram powder or any of the protein rich uh, legume powders. Yeah. And then how do we give uh, sugar? We give it in the form of jaggery or molasses. We don't use refined sugar because it's got sulfur which kills the microbes. So uh, we create these beautiful formulations which exponentially increase the microbial population. We filter that and we put it into the soil so that the sattva gets replenished. And once the microbes go there, they further multiply till they reach an equilibrium where the exact number of nutrient solubilizing microbes for nitrogen will exist. Those for phosphorus, they will reach equilibrium. For potash, they will reach equilibrium. Copper, they will reach iron, they will reach zinc, they will reach boron, they will reach silicon, they will reach everything gets an equilibrium gets established. We have farmers, for example, in Maharashtra, in Chhattisgarh, in Madhya Pradesh, who after six, seven years of doing this natural farming, they don't even need to put these formulations because the soil has reached an ideal equi equilibrium level. And then you can go to the Fukuoka method of farming which says do nothing farm. Because everything is there. Nature knows how to do it. Nature has been successfully doing it for thousands, millions and millions of years. Till we brought this white powder and put it there and got the soil addicted to chemical fertilizer. So in natural farming, there are other things of course, just uh, putting the microbes is not one. We need to mulch so that the microbes operate in the nutrient absorption zone, which is the top 150 uh, to 300 mm depth. Yeah, And we do, uh, we create what is called a food forest. It's very different from the monoculture that we do. Today in Punjab, you go in the rabi season, you go hundreds of miles you drive, it's still wheat. In the Kharif season, you go hundreds of miles you drive, it's only rice. That's monoculture. In, in our traditional agriculture, we never created a monocropping system. We had what we call food forests. And there's a lot of allelopathy that happens. Allelopathy is the interaction between plants through chemical signals where there are synergistic effects and antagonistic effects. And all those were carefully studied by our ancients to give us combinations of crops that could be grown together. There's a very ancient science called Shatru Vriksha and Mitra Vriksha. It's a, it's a beautiful science. I'm just digressing a bit. But have you ever, anywhere in your travel, seen a banyan tree and a neem tree grow together? Answer will be never. People tree and neem tree? Yes. Banyan tree and neem tree will never grow together. So our ancients had classified plants as plants which can grow together and plants which should never be grown together. So when we are doing these mass foresting, Niyawaki forests, etc., maybe we should give a heed to this. We're just taking plants and dumping them together, but there is a science. And the science itself is very esoteric because it says 
The banyan tree's ruling planet is Saturn, while the neem tree's ruling planet is Guru, Mar, uh, Guru. Therefore, the Guru and the Shani, they are not the Grahameti. That means the planetary interaction is very antagonistic. So these two trees will never grow together. Yeah. So because uh, the the Saturn is a dictator, he is a monarch. The Guru is a democrat. He is everybody is knowledge is for everybody. He is an equal opportunity uh, employer. So these two don't go together, and they've got a whole science of what crops can be grown with what crops. Beautiful science. So when it comes to pest management, so we understood how to address the problem of fertilizer. Now, the, if we don't use fertilizer, then we don't use pesticide. So how did our ancients look at pests? This is a very beautiful, uh, beautiful understanding. Modern chemical agriculture looks at a pest as something that needs to be destroyed. You have to kill it. A pest comes and attacks your crop, you have to kill it. There is no other alternative to it. Because the DNA of the companies who are manufacturing these pesticides, their DNA was to kill right from the start. Then they killed human beings on the war field, but today they are still killing human beings through the food they give you. Okay. So the DNA exists there. So their thing is kill. Now what happens when you try to do this? Nature hits back because it mutates. You put a pesticide, within three years, four years, the pesticide is useless. Today Roundup is facing that problem. We have weeds which are resistant to Roundup. What do the farmers do? So pesticides are only okay for a limited period because then you say, uh, you know, spray, spray four sprays instead of two. So increase the dosage is the first recommendation. That means you make your food more toxic. The second recommendation is then to create a pesticide which is even more toxic to the insect, which means it's even more toxic to you. So this is a vicious cycle that's going on. The pesticide industry is constantly fighting nature because nature creates pest resistant mutations. Just like our antibiotics. Yeah? Now look at the, our ancients how they thought about this. For them they said every living thing, whether it's a plant, insect, animal, human being, is a creation of the divine. It has a place. It has a place. So when the rishis in the ancient times, like Rishi Parasara and things like that, all those rishis that you heard about, and even earlier than that in the Rig Veda, when, okay, let's hypothetically imagine a situation. Uh, a little land was cleared and a crop was put, you know, for uh, sustaining, let's say, a Gurukul, where a guru lived and his uh, shishyas, you know, his students lived there, his pupils lived. So to support the food for the Gurukul, they had agriculture happening. And the Shishyas went to the uh, crop and they saw some insects sitting on the crop and starting to eat the crop. They came running to the Rishi and said, Gurudev, uh, our crops are being eaten by the insects, what do we do? The Rishi never told them, go and kill the insect. What he told them was, go and look around your field in the jungle nearby. Find, get me every plant where that insect doesn't sit on. So all the pupils ran. They collected all the, all the plants on which that insect does not sit. And they brought it to Gurudev. And he says, well, now you tell me what, what do you learn from this? So one of the bright students said, Gurudev, it appears to me that there is something in these plants that the insect doesn't like. So he says, yes, that is true. So you guys start grinding these plants. So they started grinding the plants. Then he says, extract the juice. And I'll teach you various ways of extracting the juice. Now you take that extract and sprinkle it on the plants, a crop. And that insect will come sit on the plant, doesn't like it because it doesn't like the taste of what's there. It will go and sit somewhere else, but we do not kill it. 
and therefore they created this beautiful formulations. Neem tree, if you took for example, the neem tree, you will never find an insect on a neem tree because the azadactin alkaloid is very bitter. Insects don't like it. So we make an extract called neem astra. It's some of the neem leaves that we take. We take some cow dung, cow urine, and then we take the neem leaves, yeah, we crush it, uh, and then we uh, let it ferment for 48 hours, and then we spray it on the plants. Then the second one, yeah, is the Brahmastra. So many, many plants are taken, like for example, neem, custard apple, guava, lantana, pomegranate, papaya, datura, and plants like that. There are lists, lists go on and on. So this is what the pupils brought, you know, say, you know, insects don't sit on this. So they created another one. They ground it, they made a paste. They took cow urine, which is one of the world's best known organic solvent. Cow urine, the boss indicus cow urine is the best known solvent that will extract flavonoids and alkaloids from plant material. In fact, the entire system of Ayurveda, uh, medicines in Ayurveda are based of, by extracting in the go arc. Go arc is a distillate of cow, cow urine. And from that they extract all the jadi buti, all the active ingredients, all the AI are extracted using cow urine. So they boil this multiple times and cool it and they make Nima, uh, Brahmastra and then there is Agniastra where you take things like chili, tobacco, garlic and then you crush it and you boil it and boil it and then you make the Agniastra. So one of the beautiful things is that how beautifully they, they classified insects. Our ancients had a beautiful classification. Those of you who, who ever have done or intend to do agricultural entomology, it's one of the toughest subjects because it's based on modern chemical agriculture. And all you have to do through that entire course is to just learn by rote the name of the insect, the scientific name of the insect, the chemical which has to be used against the insect, how many doses, at what dilution, at for which, for which crop. It's a matrix. Your entire semester is only learning it by rote and going and vomiting it in the exam. It's a tough course. Yeah? Our ancients never bothered with this. They didn't care what the name of the insect was. They said all insects on this planet have only three categories. There is one category where the insect comes, sits on the plant, eats the plant and flies away. So all the beetles and jacids and all these things, they belong to that category. There's a second category which comes, sits on the plant, lays eggs, larva will hatch, pupation will happen and then the insect will come out and go to another plant. So the entire life cycle happens on the plant, that's category two. And then there is one which comes and straight gets into the plant. It either gets into the fruit, it gets into the stem or gets into the root. So all the borers will come in this class. The, the ancients said there is no other class of insect in agriculture. Only three classes of insect. And what's the beauty? They've got three astras. Neem astra for one which will come eat and go away. Brahm astra for the one which will try to do its entire life cycle. And Agni astra, I told you, it's got chili, garlic, tobacco. So anything that goes and burrows inside, you've got this pungent Best repellent, which will go get the insect out so that it flies away, not allowed to complete its life cycle. Back. What a beautiful way of never to kill the insect. Just make the plant not suitable or attractive for the insect. This is why Nimastra, Brahmastra, Agniastra worked perhaps 40,000 years ago. They are working today. They will work 40,000 years in the future. Because the insect never needs to mutate. We are never killing it. This is the power of our ancient technology. When we look at weeds, for example, the glyphosate problem that I told you, we have a wonderful technology where our ancients 
had a wonderful way of looking at weeds. Ganti Shastri was talking about the use of goat manure to control nut grass. Yeah? And uh, nut grass is a very difficult thing to take out in fields because each plant will create a small hair like root and then a, a bulb will happen. And then another one, Cypress rotundus, that's the scientific name of this particular plant. Now, we have got in Vriksha Ayurveda and Krishi Parasara beautiful technologies that have been given where we can use plants and the principle of allelopathy to counter, not to kill the weeds, but suppress the weeds. Like we said, not to kill the pests, but to repel the pests. So, we have a plant which you can see, it's called Ark or uh, Madar or the scientific name is Calatropus uh, gigantea, Calatropus juncea, both of them are very similar land races. And it will have a white milky sap like this. A plant very revered in our culture, it's very revered in Ayurveda and uh, people who are familiar with our Ganapati puja that happens, the first garland of flowers will be put, will be this uh, Calatropus, the blue flowers. Now, in Vriksha uh, Ayurveda, there are shlokas which talk about the wonderful uses of this particular plant. And the use that I was most interested in was its use in suppression of weeds. And allelopathy is a science that is known to modern science. Allelopathy is when you have chemical interaction at the root level in the soil between plants. These can be synergistic, these can be antagonistic. And I spoke to you about the Shatru Vriksha and the Mitra Vriksha. Now, characterization of the alkaloids that are in the Calatropus, which have allelopathic effects on other plants, have been identified by modern science. So, what is there in Vriksha Ayurveda is based on research that today's modern science endorses. It's very important when we talk about our traditional ecological knowledge, our ancient sciences, to speak about it in the context of modern science. Otherwise, people do not listen. To it. The cogent statement must be based on modern science. It cannot be based on my Puranas. It cannot be based on what we call empirical evidence. It can't be based on some farmer saying that he received, he had this success. I as a farmer did, but that's not enough. So what do we do? We actually conduct field trials. So the first field trial that I conducted was just to take the leaves of Calatropis. I was growing beds of indigenous tomatoes. I am a seed saver and I have saved over 500 varieties of indigenous uh, vegetable seeds in the country. And we are losing these vegetables so quickly, it's unimaginable. But that's, you could Google my TED Talks uh, on this uh, topic. But I was growing some of my tomatoes, so I said, let me just put these Calatropis leaves in the bed and let me first get empirical evidence, okay? So the idea was that we uh, did that. And therefore, after 28 days, you see the two photographs. This is empirical evidence, yeah? Where T0, no treatment, it is full of weeds. The one where I had kept the calotropis leaves, hardly any weeds. But after 60 days, the crop was intact. Yeah, the crop did not suffer any loss in yield. And I got my tomatoes. So this was my empirical evidence. But if I need to present it to a platform such as you, here today, I have to go further. Therefore, what I did, I created a scientific field trial where I used a um, RBCD, a randomized complete plot uh, design with uh, 6 by 3, 18 plots. I had uh, 
three treatments, T0, T1, and T2, where T0 was the control. That means it had no ARC in it, the Calotropis extract. Uh, the second one uh, had 10% uh, and the third one, T2, had 20%. Therefore, this is a typical uh, uh, test that we do and we have the F values chi-square. Uh, the uh, formulation of the ARC was done in traditional ways. So, we have the entire calotropus being uh, ground and then it is being boiled multiple times in cow urine, all against all with using standard measurements. Yeah? So we used it. The idea here was to create something that my farmers could replicate. It, I did not want it to be a lab experiment only. I needed it to be a field trial. Therefore, once we had that, now you can see the experimental results itself. This is again visual, which is uh, T0, where you see completely uh, the weeds. They are, they are all over the plot. You have got at 10%, that's T1, you have this, and the T2 did not show any great significance. It was not very more significantly better than T1. Now, if you took the data and you did the statistical analysis, like the way we do, and you get the uh, ANOVA table and the F variance, you can see very clearly that my null hypothesis, my null hypothesis H0 was ARC has no effect on the weeds. Therefore, you can very clearly see from the data that H0 is completely disproved, H1, which means, therefore, my alternative hypothesis, which is H1, uh, works. So, when we present data this way, then there is uh, much more, the cogent statement becomes stronger because we have tremendous amount of knowledge that's sitting there and if we had gone the route of nutrition per acre rather than yield per acre, we would have been in a very different state. And just before I finish, I would like to give you a, a concrete example of one of the things. Uh, Ganti Murtiji was talking about an ancient variety of maize that was found in Sikkim and how the maize actually may have gone from here to the Americas, not the other way around. And the Mayan civilization, uh, in fact, uh, Professor Hari, he talks about this, where the Maya Sura, which was referred to in our text, is actually the Mayan civilization. Because those days we had a lot of shipping between these continents. Similarly, we have a variety of wheat, which was traditionally grown in Punjab, Haryana, which is called, which is, uh, which is known by the uh, scientific name Triticum spherococcum. It's a very peculiar wheat. It is round in shape, golden in color. And if you go to the Pingalwada ashram outside uh, Ludhiana, uh, outside Amritsar, you will find, uh, they give it as prashad. A few seeds are given to you as prashad. They grow it, but they, it's just given as prashad. When I looked at this particular wheat, I was fascinated by it. By it. And I started to get my farmers to multiply the seed, you know. So we took some from Pingalwada Ashtam. We told them that we were going to multiply this. We started to multiply this. And then uh, uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankarji, he gave the name for this as Sona Moti. Sona because it was golden in color, Moti because it was like a pearl. Now, <clears throat> when we started to grow this using natural farming, See, natural farming, you cannot put urea. If I put urea to sonamoti uh, wheat, the sonamoti will bolt. It will just become tall. One wind, one rain, it will flatten out no yield. Many of the experimental trials in our research institutions are not apple to apple because they will use our native seeds to, for evaluation using chemical means. Our native seeds can't do that. They can't take these chemicals. They have to use the microbes for their growth. They need the, uh, the nutrition to come through the microbes, not through fertilizer bags. Now, when we started to grow these with, uh, with uh, natural farming techniques, average yield of uh, wheat today across would be, say, around 16 to 20 quintals yeah, per acre. This was giving us about 
12 to 14 quintals per acre. Yeah, this sona motor. But watch this. When we did in uh, uh, in Pura in IARI in Pusa, when we did the nutritional analysis of this, this wheat has folic acid, which is never there. As a wheat breeder, we used to die to get folic acid. We never we've never succeeded in getting folic acid in wheat, which is why the bread that is made it's called. Uh, fol uh, folic acid um, augmented, yeah? It is fortified with folate, yeah? Because folic acid is very essential for our health. So during the bread making, they add folic acid, yeah? So, but this sonamuti has folic acid. All the minerals in this were at least 3x. If normal wheat has got X amount of copper or iron or zinc or whatever, this is three times that. It has got more protein in it. It has got more carbohydrate in it. Everything at least by 1.5 times. Okay. And my farmer, against the minimum support price of 19 rupees per kilo for wheat, he gets 75 rupees for this. Okay. So if you want, if we went the route of nutrition per acre, a, Sonamuti doesn't have any pesticides in it, pesticide residues in it. Plus, it is nutritionally so much more. And my Punjabi farmer tells me, he says, Saab, vaise to mein das bara roti kha leta hu. Lekin ye char roti se itna pet bar jata hai. That means, eating four rotis fills my stomach against the normal 10 or 12 that I eat at a sitting. That's because our, our stomach signals you when it's full, when, when it's got its nutrient. It, it, obesity comes because the food going inside is not triggering that response. You keep eating, you keep eating because it's not triggering. You eat this kind of food, it will trigger. Obesity gets controlled at that stage itself, you know. So if the mandate during the Green Revolution, if it was given as nutrition per acre, Perhaps our whole approach would have been different. We would have been growing crops like Sonamoti instead of our dwarf hybrid wheat that we grow today. And been outside this death trap that we are sucked into. So with this little uh, presentation, I conclude my cogent statement and uh, open to discussions uh, with you. Thank you very much for your patience here. You have already explored natural ways of farming. I, in my childhood, between 80s and 90s, observed my grandfather was using cow dung and also these goats. They were uh, used to put the goats in between coconut trees for two days. So, a group of 20 goats. So, after two days, they will shift the place. So, in one acre, it takes about five days to instead of using the urea etc but now what happens to the uh, current situation due to the technology advancements we hardly found no cows in the villages also only a person who sells the milk uh, is having cows and that too also not desi cows they are uh, using the uh, hybrid or uh, jersey, etc., whatever the huge amount of milk gives. So, whether that hybrid cow dung is useful uh, for the farming nowadays is my one question. And second, you have already explored, but uh, just in simple simple manner, you tell how to increase sattva in the soil where we have been using urine, urea, and pesticides for a long period. That is only two questions. Thank you Thank very you. much. So, uh, what you have asked is, if a land is, the second question I will take first, if the land has already been chemically farmed, can we bring back the sattva in the soil? The answer is yes, the process is known as conversion, it's got nothing to do with religious conversion. Conversion is how we detoxify the soil and it is done by a process where we use uh, what we call bioremediation which means we use very fast growing plants which are able to suck up the toxic residues 
uh, and clean the soil before we start natural farming. So it's a process that now takes as little as six months. More details you could contact me offline and or, or online and I'll tell you. Uh, your first question, sir, was about the uh, cow dung from the hybrid Holstein and Jersey uh, breeds compared to the, uh, the uh, daisy cow. Yeah. So you know what is happening with uh, milk, right, today. Our milk has got the largest amount of antibiotic. It's got the largest amount of hormones, which are lactating hormones, uh, growth hormones, polycystic ovary, for example, which is so rampant amongst young uh, ladies today, is directly linked to this. The hybrid cows, sir, eat processed food. They have to eat processed food to give that kind of milk that you're talking about. The cow dung which comes out is only good for methane production. It's good if you want to put a gober gas plant. It does not have the TU spectrum that is required for agriculture in terms of NSMs. That is why we say we need to revive these desi cows. It's got nothing to do with Hindutva. It is a requirement of our land today that we have this animal which is bestowed a elementary canal where all those dead end pouches have different different families to use of bacteria which are essential for nutrient solubilization. So I would like to know that uh, all these you know great things are happening but when I talk about a university like ours or any other places we are not aware about this knowledge. So people are not able to really see the urgency and you know which is very much required. So I would like that something can be done on this and secondly I saw that a lot of campaign on save soil campaign by the uh, Sadguru. Sad, Sadguru. So is it also about the same thing what you were just mentioning or is it a different kind of a thing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes this knowledge we need to sort of popularize it and that is why I thank Dr. Richaji for having a symposium like this. It's only when we are able to present cogent statements based on modern science are people able to listen. Empirical evidence is not sufficient. Yeah? Therefore, we need to have more uh, platforms like this where we can you know, talk about this. Uh, second thing is uh, you asked about, uh, sir, just to repeat, uh, you asked about Save soil campaign. Yeah. So basically, I, I believe there that the thrust of what uh, Sadhguru was talking about was basically to save the fertility of the soils around uh, river basins. So he said a kilometer on either side of the banks of a river, uh, you plant trees so that the, the soil does not get eroded into downstream and you know we lose it. So I think he was more talking about physically saving soil from erosion uh, and creating fertility by creating mini forests along the river banks. Um, that's how they should be. In nature, if you see, you will find very thick forests in the valleys. But the upland will be grass slopes. So you have the carnivores and the herbivores. The herbivores will be in the uh, grassland where the carnivores will rest in the uh, thick wooded parts and that is coexistence. That's a proper forest. So I think uh, it requires both. It requires to save the soil. Of course, if you don't have soil at all, then the top, if all the top soil goes away, then we are in real problems uh, and we'll all have to do permaculture after that. So uh, we require both and I think Sadhguru was more talking from that point of view rather than the biome of the soil inside the soil. Morning, sir. Excellent uh, eye-opening and uh, thought-stimulating talk. I am Dr. Giridhar from Karnataka, Mangalore. Uh, and uh, thanks to efforts like yours, the Jeevamruta is being done in small, small villages also. And it has a, a made a difference. So question is, uh, is there anything other than Jeevamruta, like uh, multiple uh, uh, different combinations which will be used for the different purposes? and uh, can you uh, throw some light on the Agnihotra techniques? Thank you. Sir. 
Thank you very much, Namaskara. Always nice to have somebody from the Western Guards. Uh, yes, there are many, many formulations uh, that are bioformulations. These are not fertilizers. These are living formulations. So we have Jeevamrita, which is a liquid formulation which has to be used within 24 hours. But you have Ganajivamrit, which is a solid where the microbes go into hibernation and you can store it for years together. No, nothing will happen to it and when you put it back in the field, again, uh, the uh, sattva starts to get, uh, uh, you know, reinforced. Yeah. So we have a lot of these formulations which are now starting to come up. Uh, many industries see this as a huge opportunity. Uh, organic uh, compounds in agriculture today is a multi-billion dollar industry. We have to be very careful that we don't slip back into another trap. So with the 22 lakh farmers that we work, we only teach them technologies that they can do at their farm level. Every one of the formulations we teach them, they can do it at their farm. They don't have to go and buy it from a shop. This, I believe, is a key that we need to look at. Rather than create another industry, and you don't know once you create an industry, what kind of a monster you will create. So uh, there are already companies patenting microbes. Soil microbes are being patented because they splice a gene into it. They do a little bit of uh, genetic engineering and call it their patented microbe. So microbes are being patented. I mean, I, it's a very scary situation for me. Ah, Agniotra, yes. Agniotra is an extraordinary technology. I have on my YouTube channel a beautiful uh, talk on Agnihotra. Agnihotra is one of the most scientific, uh, most scientific uh, uh, techniques of harnessing the power of the sun. It's actually a certain radiation from the sun which hits that 11 mile height. Uh, it's, uh, it's the interface uh, of, the, of, the, of the atmosphere at that height and then it gets uh, put into that Agnihotra Homa that we do. One of the simplest Homas, but it's got so much of sacred geometry in it. It's got the use of plant frequencies. It's got the use of uh, sound frequencies. And therefore, through an interaction of a science, we call cymatics. Cymatics is where, when waves interact to create geometry, uh, and that's sacred geometry. And that with plant frequencies, so that uh, rice within ghee which you offer, that frequency, it creates certain transformations. Uh, certain wave functions are incorporated and that ash which is there, that has got uh, tremendous properties. The, the Homa itself has sends vibrations. It's a very deep science. I have done a lot of scientific study into this. Uh, it's available in a little package called Vedic Agriculture. If you contact me, I will give it to you and you can uh, go through that. Sir, a very good morning and thank you so much for these wonderful works that you've been sharing with us. Sir, I have a farm in Sihor which is very close to Bhopal, so I'm coming from Bhopal. The issue is I educated a few farmers that were close to my land regarding uh, organic farming. So now there are two problems, sir. First thing is the produce quantity is not as much as you go, grow otherwise. The size of the vegetable is also less and it doesn't look that glossy and fresh as the other produce looks like. So the first thing is to add value in terms of health and everything. And a very common statement that I get to hear from them is, uh, the you people have a lot of diseases, here everything is fresh, so look at the amount of people that have cancer and that is, that is not there sir actually. People suffering from cancer in the rural areas there is lesser. I mean it must be 10, 5 or maybe still less. So that is a mental fallacy which people possess. The other thing is sir, uh, the value associated with 1 kg produce of say organic brinjal. So you price them at about say 80 rupees a kg, 60 to 80 is the range. The other brinjal which is available is at 15 rupees a kg. So it becomes very difficult to get the produce into the city and then have a small outlet and sell the produce. So still the rural people, they are not fascinated by this idea because the logistic involved is very costly for them. 
so uh, they are this idea becomes non saleable in a smaller society let me just address a few things which you had mentioned you had mentioned that actually in the rural areas though the chemical farming is being done the incidence of cancer is not and i'd like to share this because i work intimately with my farmers farmers who are doing chemical farming will grow for the market using chemicals but they will have a small piece of land which we will they will grow for their family you go to any farm you will find this so the incidence of the diseases that i am talking about is in the urban areas who are the consumers of that so that is one clarification i want to give you the second clarification that i need to give you is this pain point about how do i get for all my effort a better return when i am doing chemical free farming so one is organic farming using compost as i told you that's not the way but the other one is so we have to have therefore a supply chain set up so first thing you have to do is there should be some identifier which says your product is chemical free and who gives you the certification not the third party which is very expensive but pgs india which is participatory guarantee system of the ncof in gaziabad it is under the ministry of agriculture and this system can get can give you at no cost our institution art of living lakhs and lakhs of farmers we have certified on behalf of government of india as chemical free okay so they give you organic farming and natural farming mudra that is the first thing second thing that you have to do at the farmer level you must value add see our problem is our farmers are so uh, so Uh, stuck for money like you said they just want to quickly sell it but if a cluster of farmers come together they can value add and that value add is not an expensive value add we are talking fundamentally of cleaning sorting grading and packing once this is done and that supply chain is established and this can only happen through kisan manch which is farmer clusters and that's what the government of india is today is encouraging formation of clusters and creation of supply chain linkages this is the way forward ma'am and i hope uh, if uh, you need more information on this please reach out to me and i'll i'll gladly take your farmers into and create a kisan manch for you sir so my question is from rikshaveda jo hum iske pehle lecture attend kar rahe the to usme sir uh, jaise ped mein kai baar kide lag jate hain ya fir ped kharab ho raha hota hai to usme treatment ke bare mein bataya gaya तो उसमें लिखा था कि वाटर इज मिक्स्ड विद बीफ सो कैन यू पुट सम लाइट ऑन इट लाइक हाउ फार्मर आर यूजिंग बीफ और एनी लाइक अदर फ्लैशेस आल्सो इट्स मेंशन तो एक्चुअली हमारी सारस्वत सिविलाइजेशन में सारस्वत नदी के तट पे जो हमारी सोसाइटी थे वो सारस्वत तट में वो सिविलाइजेशन में देयर वाज नो सच थिंग एज वेजिटेरियनिज्म एंड ऑल दैट वो लोग इतना एनलाइटेंड थे उनको कोई टैबूज नहीं थे डूज एंड डोंट्स बट दे वर हाईली इवॉल्व बींग्स सबको रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी पता था क्या करने का था दे यूज टू प्रोटेक्ट देयर लैंड्स दे नेवर हैड एन आर्मी दे नेवर हैड अ किंग दे नेवर हैड अ टेम्पल दे नेवर हैड अ प्रीस्ट ऑल द बिल्डिंग्स वर ऑफ द सेम साइज द बिगेस्ट बिल्डिंग वॉज द कॉमन बाथ जहां सब लोग स्नान के लिए जाते थे दैट्स द बिगेस्ट बिल्डिंग दे डिड नॉट हैव किंग दे डिड नॉट हैव हाई प्रीस्ट है ना उनके लिए एवरीथिंग वाज अ प्रोडक्ट ऑफ द डिवाइन इफ देयर इज एन एनिमल एंड द एनिमल नीड्स टू बी ईटन दे विल ईट इट ऑल द टैबूज केम मच लेटर मच मच लेटर वी आर टॉकिंग इन द पास्ट टू थाउजेंड इयर्स उससे पहले जो हमारा संस्कृति थे उसमें ऐसी टैबूज नहीं थे कि यू दिस इज अशुद्ध और दिस इज एवरीथिंग फॉर देम वॉज अ पार्ट ऑफ द फुल साइकिल ऑफ लाइफ you know so they had they had a totally so when they used uh, animal parts it was to, again to create fermentation and bacteria you know so the bacteria in fact my farmers after 6 7 years of doing natural farming the insects don't come there because the plants develop signals which they give to the insect don't come here it is this is how it works actually nature has these abilities their nature has these inbuilt technologies where pheromone signaling is done by plants 
to protect themselves. But for that, you have to allow the sattva to reach equilibrium by putting urea, it gets destroyed. In presentation and uh, coming across uh, of your work of all those, you know, 99.99913% uh, 99 of the chemical component of the soil was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions regarding this. One is that, do we have any concrete measurement uh, for the microbial content of the soil? One question. A second is, I have been hearing so-called cogent statement from Safe Soil Campaign that uh, around uh, our, our earth has you know, less than 3% of organic content as of now, which needs to be replenished and uh, what we can do about it. So how do you agree with this statement? So uh, yes, I have got several publications. Uh, I did not put them up today because of the limited time. But we have beautiful data to support that when we use these formulations, the bioassay I had presented to you, but there are detailed papers. Many of, not just me, many people have done on desi cow, uh, cow dung and cow, cow urine for its mineral content. Uh, it has growth factors, uh, coenzymes, uh, it has uh, plant hormones, so many things. It's, it's all incredible how much of plant growth material and plant protection material cow urine has. Um, so there is a lot of uh, uh, research that is there. There is also data that is coming from Australia, Australian uh, Journal of uh, Soil Microbiology, if you take in the past 10 years, on specific families of microbes which are doing phosphate solubilization, potassium solubilization, nitrogen solubilization, iron solubilization. Every uh, element, there are families of microbes doing these. So it is based on solid science. This is not something that one needs to look at. Your second, the second last question, the part of it was what uh, you asked? The second part? The organic content. Sir, organic content is another big myth, sir. See, it is based on organic farming, where you use compost. And they have said that we have to take the C content. C content, maybe if it becomes 4, 5, like that, then the uh, soil can sustain. But that's only a way of selling compost. It's a way of creating demand for compost. When we go this route of NSMs, nutrient solubilizing microbes, C content has got no relation at all. My farm, for example, has got very low. It's got only some 1.2. When I, when I analyzed it, it was only 1.2 C content. But everything grows very lush in my farm. C content was another big myth that was created to sell things like vermicompost, for example. When Earthworms are present in lakhs in an acre of land. They are creating vermicompost 24-7 in C2. Why do I have to spend lakhs of rupees buying vermicompost to put into my land? So this is why I am saying when these ancillary business of biological products have started to come in the market, we have to be very careful. Not fall trapped again, fall into a trap again. Because all this is there in the soil. So... Uh, I, I, I believe that actually C content, although touted, if C content was uh, so important and people were able to achieve it, organic farming should have become a success. It's not. Therefore, I don't believe C content is primary reason why it has not succeeded. Hello. Uh, Namaskar, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I, uh, I have a question, question sir. Actually, is there any possibility of a uh, green revolution again using uh, the traditional method? Because uh, currently we are facing the same issue of uh, productivity in land or fertility, you can say. Yes, and I here I would like to echo what Ganti Murthy said. None of these should be done as a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, This should not be the way Sri Lanka did it. But I think what this country is doing is something very beautiful. Uh, the government of India today has started something called the Namami Gange project. I am one of the uh, consultants in that project. Our Art of Living is one of the uh, co-support uh, uh, agencies for that project. And uh, what we are doing is taking five kilometers on either side of the Ganga only and introducing natural farming 
in a gradual way to see how the adoption happens what will be our learnings and how we correct ourselves or improve ourselves in deployment of our ancient technologies that namami gange will then be extended to other river basins because already the preliminary data that is coming is that it is showing very good success so uh, the government of india uh, we we call it the, the, the there's the bigger one that's called the sea ganga it's in fact one of your iit uh, people who heads this and uh, uh, he is creating a technology of sustainable agriculture we he very he takes something from permaculture something from natural farming something from vedic agriculture something from our chemical farming and all that and he is putting together what he calls sustainable agriculture so uh, it is happening it is happening gradually i believe that is the way it should go forward i don't think we should do anything knee jerk rathi raj jo hai we convert india into a natural farming country no that will be a disaster but this is the only way forward i will say this again bringing back our ancient technology can be the only cogent statement for our future thank you